Hi everyone, welcome to our very last episode of Rich Reflex with our work bestie Crystal. Hi. I can't believe, babe, it's been six months. Oh my god, and six yeah. Six months of value that you have really brought to oh, us. Thank you. I mean, we, I have also, you know, spoken to you know a lot of the people in the community, and a lot of them really enjoyed the episodes with you because it's so actionable it's mm-hmm. so tangible and you break it down so well for all of us you know to be able to walk away with something that we can immediately work on thank you so thank you so much and we look forward also to your own podcast Yay. tell us about it yeah so i just launched my podcast comfort and growth yeah. with crystal be your work life bestie so it's all about personal growth and productivity every day we wake up we go through our you know morning rituals we try to set out our day for success i love that really looking forward to that check it out so we're gonna get started to answer some of the questions that the community has for you yay okay so let's go the first one is crystal you know when it comes to being in a startup versus corporate environment Mm -hmm. how do i assess which type of working environment suits me the most Mm -hmm. How much of prototyping is enough for me to make a decision? Oh my goodness, startup versus conventional big corporate environment, also versus SME. There are three different yes. sort of distinct work environments, okay? So generally, I feel that um, the the startup environment is suitable for someone with quite a flexible, self-starting kind of personality. Mm. It's like you really got to have this... Um, comfort with yeah. change yeah and it's almost like a founder's mentality mm-hmm. also yeah absolutely so like with a startup you're going to get maybe a scope of work and a job description but that is going to evolve every week if not every day so like if you're the type of person that is like you know i was hired for this jd then you asked me to do something that's not within my scope of work then how can it be then what kind of training then you're probably not suited for a startup life because mm-hmm. startup life is all about problem solving yeah. it's all about doing whatever needs to be done it's about having a very entrepreneurial mindset and taking ownership for these problems So even though you are not a business owner in a startup, you have to kind of be uh, thinking like a business owner because everyone has to make their seats count on a startup, right? There's only limited seats on this rocket uh, that is like taking off, right? And this is not the time to argue like who is sitting on which seat in the rocket, right? The rocket needs to take off. Exactly. And I think one thing I realized about startup phase is also that we generally have to cover much more than Mm -hmm. what we're expected to in terms Mm -hmm. of scope. As yes, well. absolutely. Yeah, so that's startup. We got to talk about SMEs as well, small, medium enterprises, because actually, I think the statistics are like the vast majority of businesses that hire people are actually small, medium sized enterprises. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, when you work for SME, sometimes there are less clearly defined learning and development um, opportunities in a very structured way. For example, they may not have like a um, leadership training program or like management associate program. But uh, the upside of that is that you will learn a lot. Mm -hmm. Similar to startups, they are small companies that require people to pull their weight. Uh, They probably have a more established business than startups, but you will be probably... uh, Uh, learning a lot, seeing various areas of the business, whether it's invoicing, whether it's sales, whether it's marketing, whether it's, you know, strategy. Um, SMEs tend to have a little bit more of a inverted commas, family style culture, which has pros, but also cons. For instance, sometimes I do get a lot of people saying to me that um, I don't know if there's formal systems or processes or policies, structures, like I don't know, like, you know, what kind of training I can go for, or if I make a complaint, who do I go to in HR? Because we may not even have HR to take care of us sort of thing. So uh, again, I think uh, SMEs, you need to be reasonably good at... uh, problem solving yeah. and being vocal and also not being afraid to say to management because oftentimes they want to support you. They want you to stay, they want you to grow, but it's just that the SME culture, they're very busy. Yeah. So like you might say, well, I want to go for this training program. I want to go for this, you know, I don't know, AI prompt engineering, or I want to go for this uh, leadership course. Can you actually give me some budget to go? And the advantage of being an SME as well is that you can sometimes grow in terms of your title yeah. really fast. Mm. In a corporate environment, it's like, okay, two and a half years, then promote to this rank, yes. then another three years, then this rank. But in SME, it's like if you're good, yeah, like the you stru- can rise up. Exactly. So that's SME. And I know that for startups and SME, the pace is 
vastly different from mm. an M- MNC, right? Yeah. Well, not necessarily. Some SM mm. MNCs also have very fast-paced mm-hmm. uh, lifestyles, like for example, in tech, for example. Uh. Um, but in a professional MNC corporate environment, there are a lot of systems, structures, workflow, policy, clearly defined sort of like performance review, yeah. uh, you know, coaching, uh, mentorship programs, yeah. all kinds of resources, even mental health resources. So Support. support that yeah. you can tap on so in, in, in general like when you go into a corporate uh, there is a big sort of system that really exists and is defined yes absolutely oh it can also be seen as red tapes right because yes one thing that i hear a lot from people who come from corporate background mnc background is also that there are a lot of layers to getting approvals yes. or red tapes as they call it and sometimes that also slows down the process of getting things done yes when you come into a corporate environment on the first week of work like practically the whole week is just onboarding yeah and it's just such a luxury. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, you know, you're sitting there and you're doing through a, okay, fire drill, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> PDPA, all wow. of this. And you're just going through all of this onboarding. And there's a lot of systems. Um, there, there's a lot of resources to, to, to help you. However, these systems being so well established sometimes can really get in the way. Yes. So in summary, how would you say, you know, for like startup SME and corporate, what would I be looking for Mm -hmm. if I want to join each of them? I don't know if there's an ideal answer because like it will obviously depend on your personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, what I chose to do was to start at a very big company. So I worked at a major investment bank, a global investment bank that allowed me to understand how the corporate world worked, what various divisions stood for, what is legal, what is compliance, what is sales, what is, you know, this uh, capital markets, and like understanding like how to speak at a professionally in a corporate way mm. how to navigate senior stakeholder politics and and there was a lot of mentorship and a lot of skills transfer so i learned a lot from uh my corporate experience how to navigate corporate clients and then when i came out into uh the world of being an entrepreneur i knew what the other side was like amazing yeah so then i knew how to so could infuse the best yes of the experience there yes wow. i knew how to talk to my clients um, how to behave professionally, how to network, how to you know present myself in a meeting. I had learned from the best mm-hmm. and I'd seen how it was done professionally. So it was very easy for me to navigate and I knew um, the sort of discipline yeah. and the sort of structure that yeah. I needed to have as an entrepreneur. Wow, so it's like t- extracting and taking the lessons from the good and the bad as well, right? Mm, but sure. also, I coach yeah. a lot of founders, yeah. like your, your, yourself, um, yeah. you know, who have started homegrown businesses and then been massively, massively successful. And they have never, ever worked in a corporate company, yeah. but they're still very successful. And I think how they actually um, are so successful is once they get to a certain scale, they recognize their limitations yes. and they go and hire yes. people who know how to do yes. all this corporate Either stuff. professional management team, Yes. Or people with corporate experience as yes, well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, awesome. And leading to that, you know, there's another question. I think this is more like the startup SME culture, mm-hmm. but when the work environment is ever changing and ambiguous, how do I provide clarity and assurance to the team without continuously sacrificing my own? well-being and hate space. So in developmental psychology, there is this concept called holding. And it means that in uh, times of great volatility and uncertainty, what people need is holding. Just like uh, when, let's say you have a child, like like you and Ollie, you're out there, let's say in a wet market, and then suddenly a man faints and is Mm -hmm. on the ground and maybe he hit his head and maybe there's blood somewhere. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Ollie might be a bit shock yeah. by what's going on right but then what do you do as an adult what would you do Rach I mean I would take him away yes yeah and I would try to comfort him and explain what happened yes yeah yes a- a- absolutely so that's exactly what a leader needs to do in mm. a situation of uncertainty they need to act decisively mm. like you took Ollie away so okay l- l- let's um, act in a way that uh, you know mitigates whatever that is going on uh, secondly you need to explain and acknowledge what's going on uh, instead of saying like oh Ollie nothing happened right mm. then that will leave him with a sense like oh, but I know something happened yeah. and then I'll feel very uneasy. A great leader actually acknowledges the truth of mm-hmm. what has happened, but in a way that is very digestible yeah. and helps people make sense of what's going on. Wow. So be able to say, 
something's happening and I want to acknowledge that and I want to tell you this is what I do know and this is what I don't know mm. but in a way that's very reassuring and also as transparent and with as much integrity as you can have in this situation. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. And that's really very helpful as well. I think sometimes I also relate like being a leader to being a parent, like you mm. said, right? It's really also about taking care of the lives under mm. our care. Um, there is this other question on, you know, Crystal, as a chronic people pleaser, mm. how do I better manage expectations on what I'm able to realistically deliver without feeling like I'm disappointing my manager and team? Yeah, so as a recovering people pleaser <laughs> myself, <Same here. laughs> you know, I really want to add value all the time. And then when pe my manager or my boss will come to me and he would be like, oh, can you do this? Even though I'm very busy already, I will try to think of all uh, <laughs> kinds of things that I can <laughs> add even more value, even when, you know, somewhere in my heart of hearts, I know, no, mm. this is going to cause a lot of stress for me. So, yeah. you know, in our previous episode that we did together on yes. Hit Heart Gut, yes. it's also important to tune in before you actually say yes to anything. To tune in, not just to your head thinking, but also to your heart. Um, like, is this right for me? Do I really want this? Does this correspond to my values mm. and to my gut? Like, what is my instinctual kind of wisdom say about this so I think yeah. the first thing is actually creating some space in between the request and the response mm. so my uh, therapist once said to me you know what you're going to do this homework because you're a people pleaser for the next two weeks whenever anybody wants you to do anything and they ask you for something like Rach can we go for coffee uh, Rach can you send me over the whatever yeah, yeah you're just going to say I'm going to get back to you in a moment. Yeah, so it's about creating that pause mm -hmm. where you don't immediately have that knee-jerk muscle that just, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, because that's what we have. That's what we've been conditioned as yes. people pleasers. Yeah, so it's like pattern interrupting. Mm. And then what we are training is the pause muscle. Instead mm. of the knee-jerk muscle, we're going to be training like, you know, you asked me something, Rachel, now I'm going to be like, let me just take a moment and consider that. Mm. I'll get back to you if mm. that's okay. Mm. And... um. Once you train that pause muscle, there is so much power in the pause. There is a space, yeah. as Viktor Frankl said. Yes. And in that space is all yes. our power mm. and all of our freedom. So that means stimulus happens. My boss asked me something and I want to say yes. But instead of reaction, I'm going to actually pause and I'm going to open up a space in which I can actually check in. Mm. Is this right for me? Mm. Is this what I want? Yeah, and when we get more accustomed to practicing that pause and reflection muscle, it actually sets us up uh, in life for, in so many different ways with our spouses, with our kids, with you know our friends, to just be a more considered person and also live in a more powerful way empowered way yeah and i love also that you brought up the somatic experience mm. right and also paying attention to which part of our body feels what because mm -hmm. that's usually also like you said a sign yes you know, as to whether uh, we should say yes or no and mm -hmm. go for it the next question is how do i overcome fear mm -hmm. you know when when i'm being called out in a big meeting and still show that you know i'm calm in my response even though i may not know the answer right okay first and foremost i want to say two things the first one is that it's okay to say I don't know. Yeah. It's actually a mark of maturity, experience, and confidence. Mm -hmm. Number one rule, don't BS. <laughs> don't just kind of like make it will stuff show. Up. It yeah. will show. I yeah. was just doing an offsite for an aviation company mm. and they had a Shark Tank style sort of a competition where uh, you know, we were supposed to be judges and there were all these teams that were going to pitch and like that was one theme that came up over and over again. The most senior leaders of the aviation company kept on saying, do not BS. If you don't know, just say, I don't know. Yeah. But I, And I have a plan for how I'm going to find out. Amazing. Yeah, it shows your integrity. And the most confident leaders, uh, when you look at them, they actually say, well, I don't have enough information yeah. to make that decision right now. Yes. But here's my plan for finding out. And great leaders ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So you could say when you know, you're put on the spot, you could say, well, great question. And I have some clarifying questions on my side as well. If they ask you a question, let's say they ask you about, Crystal, which kind of software do you think we should go with, mm -hmm. right? 
then I might actually say, well, that's a great question. But for me to answer that, first, I want to understand right. like what metrics yes. of success are we looking for? What do we want this software to accomplish for us that's different from what our current software is doing? So in that way, I'm not answered yes. the question yeah. but I'm just trying to get more information yeah, and context yes. to the situation I yes. love that because I realize also that you know in candidate interviews mm -hmm. sometimes you know the candidate obviously wouldn't have all the answers but mm -hmm. sometimes they BS their way through and yes. it's really obvious yes. but the times where I'm really impressed is when they come out outrightly to say exactly like what you say I don't know the answer but here are the resources that I know that I can use to find mm -hmm. the answers and after the interview they will get back over email to yes. share their thoughts and their answers and also like you said follow up with clarifying questions mm. so I think there is so much power in also admitting that we mm -hmm. don't know, but we're going to find out. Yeah, and asking good questions is yeah. a life skill, yeah. right? We all need to get much better at listening mm. and we need to get much better at asking questions. In fact, like the biggest contributor to my success in my business is when I learn not to talk so much yeah. in client meetings and actually to ask good questions because I already know what's in here. I yes. already know what I want to say, but the, yes. the meeting is an opportunity yeah. for me to find out more information from my yeah. client, from my stakeholders, what they want. And yes. the more I, the, every time I'm opening my mouth, yeah. I'm actually depriving myself from the opportunity to learn. Exactly. And I think there was an episode on Rich Reflex, which we talked about the art of asking powerful questions. Mm. So please check that out. And as a segue to that, you know, mm. there was this question that asked, how do I think on the spot when I'm asked for my opinion during meetings? If you were to ask me in a meeting, Rach, for my opinion, the first thing I would do is to take a little bit of an assessment as to how qualified I am mm. or like what is the state of my knowledge. So the first thing I might say, well, well, Rach, I'm not an expert in that particular domain, but, you know, here's what I know. Mm. So there's a little bit of a context like, am I saying that I have a lot of knowledge and therefore you should take my opinion very strongly or I don't have that much knowledge, so yeah. hold this lightly sort of thing. So I would have a little bit of a qualifier at the start. I would attempt to break the question down to certain fundamentals. So, you know, for example, let's say we're in performance review uh, okay. period now. There's a debate within uh, the management team whether this person deserves a promotion or not. So half of us think that yes. she should, half yes. of the other half think that they shouldn't. So, Crystal, what do you think? Okay, so the first thing I'm doing is going to qualify what my experience or expertise is. So I might say, Rach, well, personally, I haven't worked with Francesca that much this year, I but I have done two projects where she's been involved. Um, so that's the qualifying bit. And from uh, my experience working with her, this is how I would look at it. Now we come into phase two, and I'm literally making this up. I'm just trying to deconstruct how I think. Yeah. Uh, phase two would be, I'm going to give you a structure or a mental model. Mm. So phase two would be, Rach, when I look at who should get promoted or not, um, I tend to look at two pieces. One piece of it is the what Francesca has delivered, the results. The other piece of it is the how has she done it? Has she been collaborative? Has she been, you know, uh, positive? Has she been like, you know, great for our culture? So this is the second piece is I'm going to give some sort of structure as to how I'm approaching this mm. question. And then the third phase for me would be now I will go into assessment. So when we come to the first part of it, um, the performance part, she's delivered great results in ABC. But if I look at the second half of it, Rach, how she's delivered those results, I don't think she's been as collaborative as she could have been mm. and then the fourth phase is I'm going to give some specific data to back up those broad observations yeah. so I guess like that's my informal model yeah wow that's great because I think sometimes I, I love that you also have a qualifier in the very beginning yes. right? because this is really about your opinion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than let's say answer like mm -hmm. what we spoke about the question earlier so yeah, yeah. because a lot of people would just be like no la I don't think you should promote her exactly like, but oh yes or like Based on what? Yes. Like, I, I'm a very so that, structured thinker. So that fall phase is really very helpful for yes. us. Awesome. <laughs> so, Crystal, the next question is, mm. you know, I'm good friends with all my team members. Okay, Salah already. <laughs> <laughs> wrong. Wrong. Oh, already. Oh, dear. Wrong. Okay, oh, no. sorry. Sorry, continue. <laughs> I'm good friends with all my team members. However, 
and therefore there's a problem, right? So how do yes. I draw boundaries to not let them abuse this closeness by underperforming? Yes. Uh, while whilst you stay as good friends. <laughs> I cannot take this. Okay, so when you start off as I'm good friends yeah, with my team, emplo- members. team members and employees, it's already like, you know, it's a very tricky situation because mm. in a work context, we are not friends. We are not family. Primarily, we are a high performing team. team. So when you start off with like, we're good friends. No, we're not good friends. Like, you know, when you go to work, you don't need to be best friends. You don't even need to be good friends. You need to be a high performing team. Mm. Yeah. So you need to have that mentality where the focus is on what value can we create? How can we optimize how we work together? And uh, primarily, we are a collaborative, high-performing team that has trust in each other, but doesn't necessarily have to be each other's best friends or good friends. In certain industries like media, like startup, you know, because they spend so much time with each other. It's very personal mm, and the lines are blurred. It's very informal and then there's no boundaries and then the lines are blurred. And it can give people whiplash when one Mm. minute their boss is like, oh, you know, advising them on their relationships, they're sharing something something like a confidant and everything yeah. and they are, they are you know joking and the boss is like oh yeah come over to my place on the weekend for barbecue with my kids then the next minute the boss is saying that this is totally unacceptable right. I'm gonna have to see some marked improvement on your metrics it's like a complete different tonal shift yeah right so I feel like good leaders need to be able to have that range mm. in which you can be comfortable giving somebody hard feedback and also comfortable being a coach yeah. and a supporter. So I would say that generally at work, I try to use this language like we're a high performing team, you know, mm. one team, one dream sort of yeah. thing, rather than like, oh, we are family, we are friends and, and, and that sort of language. Yeah, and I've had to also learn that the hard way. You know, mm. when I first started, I wanted to be friends with everyone. I wanted yes. to be liked by everyone. Yes. But, you know, through the years, I've also learned it's harder for me to draw the line sometimes and have boundaries where there is underperformance or there is something I need to speak to uh, my team member mm-hmm. about you know I find I, I struggle a lot more with yes. having that hard conversation I also think there's another part to this which yeah. is fairness yes. and the perception mm-hmm. of fairness mm-hmm. 100% so yes. yeah so like for me okay tell, tell you a specific story yes I was managing a team and were like 50 people on this team so my office is very big open floor plans like 50 people in this floor plan and then from the main door to the office to my office I have to walk along this particular corridor and then there's people left and right of my path right so when I was um, you know uh, walking down this corridor I would always say hi to the people on the left and the right side of me but of course the people at the far (laughs) end of the room I don't get to see them that much unless I go to the toilet or something right and then to my horror I found out that on the office unofficial gossip whatsapp group the part of of the room that that was very close to me they were nicknamed Sentosa Cove Because they were supposedly like the atas, you know, high class people that like, oh, you were always in my favour. But it was just purely because of my walking path. And that is when I realised that people are very, very sensitive to that perception of fairness and favouritism. So even though in my mind, I was just doing what was normal and making a little bit of conversation. Hey, Rach, how are you? Oh, look, baby is whatever this and that. But the fact that I didn't do it to those other people, it made a huge it was a negative morale factor Mm. for them Mm. and then I realized that part of being fair is also trying to consciously eliminate these sort of like uh, perceptions of unfairness so Mm. not buying a birthday cake for Mm. example even though I want to buy a birthday cake Mm. because if I buy a birthday cake for for you it means I need to buy a birthday cake for all 50 people and am I really going to do that probably not right Mm. Yeah. I love that. And that's why there is also a shift uh, like for us, you know, um, in Le Ponito from calling each other family to mm-hmm. team, mm-hmm. right? Because I think about it like in a sports team, mm-hmm. we're all accountable for the role or the position that we play. Mm-hmm. And 
if there is underperformance for mm -hmm. a prolonged period, you know, you have to sit on the bench or do PIP and mm -hmm. things like that. And it's just normal. So I think that is something that, you know, like in family, they say that you tolerate. With family, it's like you can't fire them. You can't fire them. <laughs> you can't them. get rid of yeah. them. So it's like for life, right? Yes. So uh, where is it work? Yeah, mm -hmm. this is a contract in which you deliver mm -hmm. and you get paid mm -hmm. and you deliver and you get promoted. You don't yeah. deliver, you don't get promoted. So it's very much more performance based. It's not no to good friends, but it's first and foremost, mm -hmm. you are a high performing team. And then secondary, before, else. before yeah. everything else. Yeah. And then secondary to that, yeah. we can have a friendship. Mm. But the focal framing of that relationship mm. is that we are great partners. We are great collaborators. And we've also become friends. But it's not like we are good friends. Right. And also sometimes we work together. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's very, very helpful. Yeah. The last question is, mm -hmm. you know, Crystal, how do I know when it's time to quit? So many people talk about mm. the power of grit and resilience, mm -hmm. right? But it's also important to know when to throw in the towel. Mm -hmm. I always say that, you know, one of the worst advice is don't give up. Because I really do believe that there are certain times in our lives where we need to give up. Yes. So how would you advise us? So I think the answer has a lot to do with self-awareness. So the first part, internal self-awareness, is how well do I know my values, my strengths, uh, my weaknesses, my blind spots. So for example, if I am figuring out whether to carry on my mm. side hustle, which is not making money or throwing the towel, is this actually my strength? Is this actually aligning with my values? Yeah, Is this something that I really feel internally that I'm confident about it? The other half of that decision is external self-awareness. And that is kind of understanding how you come across to the world. And this is getting feedback mm. from other people. Like so, blind spots that we have. Exactly. So I might say, oh, I've been trying this whatever cupcakes business for some time. It hasn't been delivering any results. And I'm very convinced about this. But maybe I'll just go and ask a few people who are either experts on the business, who know me really well, can give me a different third party view and sanity check whether it my internal self-awareness is really on course. Mm. So I think it's kind of both, like getting clear on like, is this serving you? Is it stressing you out too much? Mm. Is it something that you really deeply care about? Is it something that you are very equipped to do? And then the other half is kind of verifying yeah. that with like neutral third parties. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And I think also, you know, to add on to that structure, it's also about like what you taught us in the last episode with you on our head, heart and gut. Mm -hmm. And to be able to use the in, these three intelligences to weigh it out and to make that choice as to whether we should stay or we should leave. Yeah, I think though, a very general rule of thumb is that if every day you wake up, and you shower, you think about this question, oh, should I stay, should I go? And then you brush your teeth, think about the question. Then you go to work, think about the question. It's probably a good indicator yeah. that it's not your zone of genius. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, yeah. it's not working out and, and maybe that's causing a lot of tension, a lot of blockage yeah. because you maybe don't just want to accept the truth mm. of the reality that you're efforting a lot mm -hmm. and somehow it's not working. Yeah. yeah, and I think what helps me is also talking to a trusted friend a coach or a mentor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to also talk through you know exactly how i'm feeling and why i'm feeling this way because sometimes when we do that we get we articulate you know our inner deepest thoughts that we either don't want to come to terms yes. with or you know was just unearthed within us yeah i think it's a really good point having somebody mm. who can help you um separate out which part is the ego yeah. drive. I'm yes. doing this. I refuse to give up because it's my ego. Mm. I don't ever give it's up. Pride it's my I pride. To, yeah. I don't want to give in. Or is it coming from a place of genuine mm. love and genuine passion or genuine conviction rather than just from an ego place? Yeah. yeah, I love that. Thank you so much, Crystal, for sharing with all of us. Is there any last maybe word of advice or, or word of wisdom that you want to share with our community as we end season one and hopefully we get to see you again in season two wow you see <laughs> she <laughs> asked me she asked me on there. camera <laughs> <laughs> so crystal yes <laughs> uh, um okay la parting words um when it comes to your career yeah. take your work damn seriously 
but don't take yourself too seriously. I meet too many people in the world who do it the opposite. They take themselves very seriously, that ego very big, oh, you hurt my feelings mm. and whatever. But then they don't take their work seriously. So like the kind of people I like to work with are people like you, Rachel. It's like, wow, we can have a laugh. We can take the piss <laughs> off each other. Yeah. We can be like, oh my God. We can say like hard truths yeah. to each other. We don't take ourselves and our ego so seriously. Yeah. But when it, when it comes to work, Rach, mm. if you tell me, I need this thing by this deadline, mm. I'm going to get this done. I know for mm. sure, 100% mm. trust in you that mm. you are professional and you take your work seriously. Aw, thank you. And in the meantime, while we go for a break after season one for Rich Reflex, mm. remind us where can we find you online? Well, um, when Rachel's podcast season finished, then feel free to come yeah! over <laughs> to my podcast, yes. Comfort and Growth with Crystal Lim Lange. And I'm also on Instagram, on TikTok and LinkedIn, <laughs> all under the same handle, Crystal, L-I-M-L-A-N-G-E, one word, no spaces. Thank you so much, Crystal. It's been an amazing season one with you. So much fun. We have gained so much just from, you know, the last six months uh, with monthly episodes with you and we definitely look forward to more. And if you have any uh, takeaways that you have had from this episode or any word of gratitude and appreciation that you want to give to Crystal, please feel and free rich. to share it with us and we'll be so happy to also hear from you and any feedback that you have for us so here's saying goodbye to our final episode with our work bestie Bye. for now goodbye for now thank you so much again crystal see for you. being so generous with your wisdom it's and a advice pleasure. see you guys Bye. Bye.